There's something um, very fulfilling about making stuff. It's just extremely rewarding, providing it all goes to plan, of course. Weather. It's one of the few things in life that we can't influence. Sure, it could be argued that certain decisions we make now may be affecting the weather long term, but for now we need to prepare ourselves and our camping gear to tolerate whatever the weather throws at us. In this instance, we are improving our makeshift awning walls with something that can protect us, something that will be easy to use, something that will keep the weather at bay. Bring on our homemade awning walls. I'll add a bit of fabric. Of course the, uh, the fabric's not quite right size for what we want, so we need 2.4 drop, 2 metres wide, so I'm going to have to extend the length, that'll be easier than trying to add a little bit on the width, should work. There's something um, very fulfilling about making stuff, I reckon. Stuff. Uh, to be able to start from scratch, here we go, roll the fabric, a few components, bit of zip, bit of thread, a few sewing machines in this case. To be able to convert that to a functional, um, high value actually, high value product, high value to us in that end result will mean that we'll be able to be more comfortable in certain conditions in the bush. It's just extremely rewarding building stuff, making stuff, getting from nothing to something, an end, an end product. Providing it all goes to plan, of course, it can be frustrating <laughs> in the process, but uh, the end result's usually pretty good. So if you've never had to put a zip in something, so a zip, no matter what it's in, whether it's in a jacket, whether it's in, even if it's in your fly, <laughs> um, in this case, it's um, in this length of canvas, I know that that zip there is exactly the right length because it's been already been cut for the other half of the zip that's in my awning. But if you've never had to put a zip in, there's a couple of little tricks you might be able to use, is that me, me, the end result has, is that this piece of canvas has to match that length between there and there. So there's no use sewing it on, sewing it on, sewing it on, sewing it on, and then find that either your zip's too short or your zip's too long, you know, close to the end, and then you're trying to ease it in or, um, you know, there's no use getting to a point and then your canvas and the end of your zip are different lengths and you either have to cut the canvas to length or you cut the zip to length. Well, that won't work because your zip is a predetermined length based on the first half that was sewn in. So, a little trick is to make sure you don't get close to the end of what you're sewing before you realise it's either too short or too long and you have to try and ease it in. So what you do is you just fold your, depending on the length, Depending on the length that you've got to sew, in this case, I reckon I'll be good just to go in half, get a feel for it, but 
you just fold your material in half, little nick, little nick or a, um, you put a pencil mark, okay. So we know there, get your zip, do the same thing. Fold it in half. Give it a, you know, a bit of a stretch, not too much tension, but so it's consistent on both sides. Fold it in half. And in this case, we'll just put a little pencil mark. You don't want to cut the zip tape. Chinograph pencils, they're bloody dodgy. You could put a little, you know, put a Sharpie, just put a little dot either side. So when we're sewing that in now, as I'm coming along, I'll start up here. I've got a bit of seam allowance added onto there. I'll be sewing that along, sewing that along, and I'll get to, you know, close to the center as I'm coming in. I can see whether I've got to put tension on the, on the zip or on the fabric and get that halfway point lined up. And then we'll keep going and we can work towards the end then and get the ends lined up. So it means you can ease in over half the length. If it was long enough or stretchy material, I might put a few more, fold that in half again and put another couple of marks just so that I can, at regular intervals, make sure I'm all lined up. There's not a lot of stretch in the canvas. There's a little bit in the zip, but not a lot. So that's just a little trick for putting zips in. Just make sure you've got a few markers halfway because it doesn't work if you've got different length fabric or different length zip here to what's on the other half. Might work. It's been a while since I've been on the machines. <laughs> got to remember how it all works, how to do it. So I'm making these walls out of materials and things that I had laying around. Um, I didn't want to have to go and purchase more stuff. I just make it out of what I got. Works out, well, it's not cost neutral. Obviously I had to buy the materials once upon a time, but it's all left over from other bits and pieces over the years. Just happened to have a couple of industrial machines lying around from a previous life. So, if you've got it, might as well use it. So I was talking before about making sure your zips um, going to work in the length that you've got to work with. So there you go. There's the halfway mark there, and there's my little red dot. So that's Mac Bang on there. So I've sort of I'm checking as I go. I know that I don't have to ease one in more than the other. In no hurry. So that's spot on that halfway mark. And I run the, the foot of the machine just runs the, along the back of the the tooth of the, the zip, that way you get just a nice straight line. The zip tape in this case is lined up with the edge of the fabric. Get rid of the sliders out of the way so you don't bloody run over them because that um, scares the poop out here and makes a hell of a mess. Because I'm using just materials and whatever I've got at hand, I don't have um, I don't have thread the same colour as the fabric, but I'm not that precious where that matters too much. I use white because it's universal and black. So that zip just went in there. So I'm gonna pull that out and get my seam allowance in there, that's gone in there, perfect length. I'm gonna run through there now, hem that up down the sides. But I'm, before I do that, I'm actually gonna extend my fabric. So I've got my full 
2.4 meter drop and then I'll do my final hem. Just do a bit of a trial fit while I'm going to make up the, the next bit. So this zip that's already on the awning actually wraps around the corner a little bit. So that's something I'll have to think about when I'm uh, fitting it in the field. So we just have to back that pole off, take some tension off that pole, just so you can get the zip around the corner. Now the plan is I'm gonna put an extension, so an extension onto here that'll tuck into there just down to that point there, it'll finish. And why do that? Because what happens is the water runs off the, the awning here, comes down, falls in this channel here above the doors, which is doing its job, stopping the water. But then if you, the car's on a slight hill, the truck's on a slight slope, it runs along that channel there and drips down the back, not quite into the door, but you end up with a big wet area over the steps. So if I just put a flap in there, it goes into there, that'll just stop the water running along there. That's the sort of thing you don't sort of realise is an issue until it actually bears its, uh, bears its head. And then that'll just come down on a, straight down there. I can still get my water door open. That'll come down, peg to the ground. That'll all be sewn up more, that'll be hemmed. Pretty good colour match. Bit of a fluke, really. I don't know. Let's make it a bit longer. So with the, um, the join, because I've got to extend that, what I've done is I've laid it out on the original roll of fabric so that this edge, so the bottom edge, is actually the selvage of the material. So it's, um, it won't unravel, it's, it's sealed up through the weaving process. That won't unravel, so there's no need to do a big bulky um, seam there to join the two. So what I do is I take the two, the, a salvage edge that I've just cut off the roll and I can literally just do an overlap join making sure that I've overlapped them the right way so the water will run, it'll shed off the outer layer there straight down. If I was to do that the other way, the other way any water running down would go behind that layer. So we just overlap it the right way and then any water will just shed straight off. So we use two salvage joints, uh, two salvage edges, and um, literally just overlap them. We've allowed for the, the overlap in our seam allowance. And we'll just sew those two together there. Then we'll hem the bottom, add our little flap on the side. We'll make our flap up on the side. Oh, I think we're making some progress. Doing these overlap joins can be a challenge in that you end up with a lot of fabric under the arm of the machine. It's not so bad in this instance because I've only got 400 mil that I can easily fold up. But if you're trying to join two big lengths of fabric together, you've got to try and squeeze all one half of that through the arm of the machine. And um, there's probably a trick to it. I don't know it. What I've also done is I've just drawn a line down here so I know how much to overlap. I've also marked me halfway mark. Should have a mark on here somewhere. There's a little cut there, so they should line up just like I did with the zip. Just to make sure that I'm tracking okay. I'm a bit uh, rusty when it comes to doing some of this stuff because uh, I'm sure people are wondering, am I in the, the canvas game? And the short answer is, no, from a commercial point of view, or not anymore anyway, the long answer is 
I still tinker. Some of these bigger canvas pieces can take a fair bit of working and maneuverability and um, geez, you can start aching after a while trying to maneuver it and drag it and there's a bit of weight in it when you start moving a big tent or something around under the machine. Right, we'll just um, hem the base up. By having that overlap seam that we put in earlier where we joined the two layers together just as an overlap rather than a big bulky seam this is where it comes into its own because I've got to now hem the edge and it's actually just well works out a lot less layers that you're, that you're trying to sew through at that point these machines will sew through a fair bit of fabric but it's a lot easier on them if they don't have to and easier on me. So the walking foot, I'm not sure if you can see it there, there's two feet walking along so they actually climb over those um, any intersecting seams, they climb over it quite easily. It's on we run a second stitch, top stitch along the top the zip there Run a hem down the side there. Just got to work out where this is going to go. Right there, perfect. So it's starting to take shape there. A little flap on the side there. There's our zip. That'll just tuck in there. A couple of eyelets in the bottom. What we might do on this side, where it'll join the pole, we might just put a bit of a Velcro tab on there, just so it can loop around the pole. Go. Oh. Out of bobbin. This is just the top stitch now, top stitch the zip down. Moment of truth. Well, how's that for a rookie mistake? I put my little flap on the wrong side. <laughs> oh dear. Oh, take two. So after a trial fit, I found that my flap here that I need to slide in is actually, or well, two things, needs to come up and start from up a lot higher and it needs to be about twice as deep. So I've got to take that off, make a new flap up, a bit bigger, a bit higher. It's all trial and error when you're doing this sort of stuff. It's not until you sort of start making the second one, third one, fourth one that A, you get a system, but also you, you know that it works. I suppose we could spend more time at the drawing board, or is this the drawing board? So I've opted to uh, do something just a little bit different here and go with this PVC fabric. Um, the main reason being is that it it doesn't need to be treated, doesn't, you don't need to hem it and carry on um, and it's a bit flexible in terms of I can trim it down to size while it's in situ and not have to re-hem it. So, and it, the nature of it, it's a bit stiffer, it'll slide in the gap there um, that I want it to fit into. It's a little bit sort of it's hacky if you like, sticky, so it'll help sort of stick it in place. Anyway, we'll give it a run. And this, this piece of fabric actually acts as a bit of a rain gutter. So the fact that it's um, this PVC 
it'll just function just that little bit better. It's all part of the design process, I suppose. You do prototypes and rehash and change, think about it. Right, so we've got our uh, little extension on there, which will sit in there between the two cabinets, the camper and the toolbox. Act as a bit of a rain gutter. So that, that'll just fold in there when the whole thing gets packed up. So what have we got to do now? We've got to put some eyelets in on the bottom hem. Probably just, I don't know. I'll put three in, but it probably only needs one in each corner. But you never know. You get a bit of wild weather occasionally. And I've deliberately kept this bit shy of the ground, so I might put uh, just a little elastic loop in there as well. You know, just give it a little bit of give and a little bit of adjustment. Oh, when it comes to eyelets, <coughs> you need a couple of bits and pieces. They need to be able to put a hole in it, obviously, so just use a wad punch for that. Wad punch being the right diameter. This one's getting a little bit knocked around. Needs a, needs a bit of love, actually. It'll be right at the moment, but we might touch that up before the day's out. So the eyelet it comes in two parts. So you've got your an eyelet, post, and a washer. And they go together. Now they've got a bit of a contour to the, the washer. So you want to make sure that goes on the right way. And the rule of thumb is that there's a bit of stamped writing on the bottom there. You should be able to see that. That way the, when the washer nests together, you've got maximum contact on the fabric and as a rule of thumb just from aesthetics I suppose your washer would normally be on the inside because this is a um, manual process we haven't got a machine or anything it's literally just using hand dies and a, and a hammer nice block nice hole so your dies come in two parts what you normally do is you just push your oil it through the through the hole it's a nice fit the washer will sit with the the writing down on the post put the post on there sit the whole lot together get the other half it's usually all it takes so it's still a little bit loose there it's just started to roll that over. I'm getting a little bounce back off me, off me log here, so we'll have another go. Put it over the leg of the table. You should just put a little bit of lube on these first. Little bit of spit, but I, I didn't do it then. A little bit of machine oil, even. So you've got the, the washer in the back there, nice roll on the on the eyelet. No gap between the two that way, no spinning. That's, that's a good eyelet, perfect. And we want to put one in the middle, so we just pinch those two together. There's the middle. Let's get our pencil. And line. Once again, we want the eye to be in the middle of our hem. There you go. As easy as that, three eyelets. The other thing I'm looking at doing is just putting a little bit of a peg loop in each of these eyelets. So just this is shock cord. What's that, about six, eight mil, something like that. There's different ways you can do it, but for the sake of uh, what's on hand, material wise, I'll probably end up just putting a knot in there. But that'll give me just a, a peg loop there that I can just, it's quite strong this stuff, so that'll just give me a little bit of give 
um, and then compensate for any uneven ground in that as well. To do that, we'll head over to the uh, cutting station and um, cut a length of this, or three lengths, and put a couple of peg loops on. So what we've got here is a... Bloody cockies are making a racket out there. Sulfur crested cockatoos. We've been inundated with them at the moment. It's a good season. Hi, hi, Bill Schneider. HSGM, Heibel Schneider. No idea if that's how you say it. But anyway, this is a hot knife. So basically what you've got is a, it's a bit like a soldering iron, I guess. Pull the button and the tip he heats up. But this is actually a, um, a knife. So this is for cutting webbing, um, ropes, that sort of stuff. So basically you get it, there's a little light on there just so you can see where you're cutting, I suppose. But you get it to a bit of heat, it usually takes a little bit for the first one. Um, and basically what it does, it'll cut and seal the end in the, at the same time. You see a bit of smoke coming off there now. Just cuts through there. So it's actually, I won't touch it because it'll be burn. But phew, it smells good, it's probably terribly bad for you. But that's sealed that up now. And... Um, Fluoro light's a problem, isn't it? You know, there's other ways you could have just cut it with a knife and then use the lighter or a match or something like that. But, you know, if you're doing a few of these things and you want a nice, neat cut, that's this is the tool for the job. I don't know, so we'll thread that through there. Shock cord's pretty good because it binds up on itself. Put a bit of tension on it, it sort of locks in together. Pull them tight, then you pull them together. That's not coming undone at all. Just a simple peg loop. On each of those eyelets, I've only done the one so far, but I'll replicate that for all three and you know that just gives us a little bit of flexibility and versatility in how we can peg that out and compensate for any uneven ground. It takes a little bit of load pressure off the wall if there's a bit of wind around, just a little bit of give in there. There's other ways you could have done that with using proper rope end clips and things, but hey. You've got to have them, but also it's just more work and cost and not free. And uh, it's replaceable in the field. A little bit more bulky, I suppose. That's its downside. We'll just go put the last one on and I think that'll be the job done for this wall. I don't know, moment of truth. So there you have it. That wall's up. That's nice. So what I've done, the, that's taut down there, peg in there. I didn't have to use the peg loops at, in this instance. I was able to just go straight through the eyelet. But here's our extension fabric in there, that green bit that feeds up between the, and a gap between the camper and the, the toolbox. See, there's the stove. That wall's going to keep any water off the stove, off the kitchen, off the little prep table. So that's going to be a vast improvement over our little blue tarp. And the fact that it just zips on means that you're not fiddling trying to tie things up in the corners and tension it out at the bottom. Of course, you're only ever doing this when the weather's inclement, but that'll keep the wind out. Have a little fire pit out the front there. We'll put another wall on the end there. I think that'll do it. Because in theory, that wall there should be able to go there as well, one or the other. That's good. I'm wrapped with that. Something else to carry, of course. More weight, more bulk. Not that we're short of room. <laughs> thing that because you're actually expecting it to happen I just had had a thought I'll be running out of bobbin soon 
But when it happens, you're actually not paying attention and you don't realise it's happened. Why is that? That's the thing with these walking foot machines, because the feet are doing that, they will climb up over your finger. Years ago I caught me middle finger under there, the needle went straight through it, sewed my finger to the bench. So I had to reach over with my left hand and try and wind the needle over without going further in, I had to try and wind it out. And you gotta remember which way to do it. And with these industrial machines, you gotta have your foot slightly on the accelerator, slightly on the pedal to release the clutch on the motor before you can wind it over by hand. So I'm trying to just touch the pedal without it sewing, reaching over with my opposite hand, trying to remember which way to wind it in order to get the needle out of the middle of my finger. When I finished, when I come out, I had a bit of thread through my finger and it hurt. foot just climbed up over that. Often if it's um, just your standard old sail machine, um, without that walking foot, it would walk up to, or sew up to that point and then get hooked on it and just sit there. And you have to try and drag the fabric through. So that's the second wall. I'm just going to put a little bit of Velcro on this one. There's a strip of Velcro required there to there, and then it'll hang off here, and um, that'll just cinch up to the uh, wall of the camper. So what I'm doing here is I've just marked a bit of a radius there. So I've got some hook Velcro. Because this is going to be sewn on without any backing, any reinforcement backing, no other sheet of fabric, I'm just going to cut, I've got to cut a, a radius on these, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut it with the hot knife. And the rationale behind that is that it'll actually seal the, the Velcro from unravelling, because anybody that knows used a bit of Velcro before, you get a raw end and it'll just start pulling apart. So that has cut it and sealed it at the same time. The reason I've gone for such a wide bit of Velcro is the mating surface, the hook is only 50 mil on the, um, on the, on the camper, it's only 50 mil wide, but this just allows a bit of give, a bit of adjustment, because um, you know, canvas, when you pitch it, it's always on a slope or different tensions. This will just give me a bit of room to play, basically. And uh, it's black because you can have any colour you want as long as it's black. Uh, in theory, should be that second wall complete. It's very satisfying making stuff like this. A bit of trial and error to start with, but that second one come together in no time. And compared to the first wall I built there, first one was R&D, second one was production. One sample for R&D is actually pretty good. 
But, um, we'll go and fit that up and I reckon we'll call that as a job done. When you're starting a zip off, it's one of those zip ends, you just got to be a bit sympathetic to the zip because that is very vulnerable and uh, once broken, that zip's had it. Good space. Yeah, you can feel it. That's a quite a hot day today, and I can feel it blocking out the breeze straight up. Um, so, you know, a day like today, it would actually be a bit unpleasant having those walls there. But you could probably you know, fold the corner up and allow the air through. The reality is, I wouldn't have them up, and it's a nice day there. They're inclement weather walls, really. I reckon that'll do it. Good job. It's a little bit different this video, just a bit of tool time really. Just thought I'd sort of share with you some of the things we do. It's not all about being out there and off-road in whatever capacity that is. It's, um, it's about preparing. You know, this is long time in the making really. There's been lots of trips sort of mulling this idea over. And, um, you know, I can't be away this weekend. So, why not be working on being away next time? Anyway, yeah, if you like what we're doing, give us a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button, uh, hit the notification bell so that you get a heads up whenever something new's coming along. Let's get out there and put it to some use. See you next time.